In this edition of Back in History, we bring to you the story of how Lucio Gunobas and Joy escaped being killed by Lieutenant Colonel Boka Dimka in 1976 in Lagos State, Nigeria. In Back in History, we take you back in time to the events that occurred in the historical past with a view to preserving these events in contemporary digital forms for the benefit of today and the benefit of tomorrow. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. Olusegunu Basinjo was deputy to Motala Mohammed. Motala Mohammed was Nigeria's third military head of state. He succeeded General Yakubu Gowon in a bloodless military coup in 1975. He then commenced the governance of Nigeria from the moment of his takeover in a military coup until he was gunned down by armed military men at a traffic point in Lagos State, Nigeria, barely 200 days from when he took the oath of office. The man who led the team that killed General Motala Mohammed was Lieutenant Colonel Boka Sukadimka of the Physical Education Corps of the Nigerian Army. The action of Dimka soon after the assassination of the head of state showed clearly that Dimka's mission was to effect a change of government in Nigeria and possibly install a government conceived by him. In such situation, if the person that served as Motala's deputy had been seen or found, Dimka and his men would have assassinated him in their bid to effectively bring Motala's regime to a conclusive end. As noted earlier, General Motala's deputy was Olusha Gunobas Njo, also a general in the Nigerian army. But by a stroke of luck, Olusha Gunobas Njo escaped being killed. The question then is, how was this possible? In his book, Not My Will, first published in 1990 by University Press Limited and reprinted by the Olusha Gunobas Njo Presidential Library Foundation in 2022, particularly at page 39. Holusha Gunobasanjo has narrated how he escaped being killed by Dimka's men on the day of the assassination of General Motala Mohammed, as follows, unquote. On that fateful Friday, 13 February 1976, chosen by Dimka to strike, I was to have several early appointments in the office. But my ADC had told me the day before that then Colonel Olu Bajoa had a baby and would come that morning to traditionally break the news to me. My ADC had told him that he would do it on Bajoa's behalf if that was all he was coming to do. I ticked off my ADC and ordered him to ask Olu Bajoa to see me as he desired. Promptly that morning, Olu showed up. After congratulating him, he asked my permission to name the child after me, which I, of course, granted. Olu was usually like that, respectful and formal, when dealing with seniors and elders. We talked briefly about the state of the nation. He promised to come back and talk some more about things in general and the security situation in particular when he returns from visiting his family in Ibadan. In accordance with tradition, I sent through Olu a gift for the child and named the child Olushegun as the father desired. Obasanjo continued, still unquote, as soon as Olu left, I hurried in to dress up. I had just put on my trousers when I heard a loud shout outside. It was from the neighbors in the house across the road. They had heard that Motala was shot close to his official residence, which was just within one kilometer from where I lived. I was struck with disbelief and utter confusion. Soon after, my ADC came in and confirmed what I just heard. He said he saw the vehicle and witnessed the confusion around the scene where the head of state was shot. While still trying to collect my thoughts and control myself, an old schoolmate, Mr. Koni Amodu, came in and suggested that I should come with him to a safe location. He lived in a block of flats almost overlooking the scene and had apparently 
also seen the pandemonium when the assassination took place. He was still trembling when he came in. I quickly changed into Mufti. As I still could not establish the identities of the co-plotters, it was advisable to be as unrecognizable as possible if only lightly armed. He continued still on quote. Mr. Amudu offered to take me to his boys' quarters, where he thought I would be safe. I declined, explaining that as much as I needed security, I would also need communication and perhaps more so, I had no way in particular to go. We drove around Ikoi, and as we did not think it was wise to drive out of the relative security of Ikoi, we did not know what could lie in waiting at two exits out of Ikoi, Obalende, and Awolowo Road. It was in this mood of confusion mixed with fear and anger that I saw a house which I definitely recognized at Queen's Drive. It was Chief S. B. Bakare's house. By this time, my anxiety to know what was going on was almost choking. I literally barged into the house. Fortunately, the chief was in and his telephone was working. The news had obviously spread through Ikoi that Motala and I had been assassinated and a melancholy mood gripped most people. Chief Bakare was struck with this belief, fear and grief when he saw me. Quietly, he opened the door and as soon as I was safely delivered, Mr. Modu left. Obasanjo went on with the story, still unquote. I asked the chief if I could make use of his telephone and he showed me into a small room. I sat down and immediately I called the inspector general of police's number. Alaji MD Yusuf picked up the phone, expressing sadness and subdued delight when he heard my voice. He was otherwise an emotionless man with a vast experience in security duties. He did not ask me where I was, just in case someone was listening in. I did not also tell him either. I asked him to give me a situation report of what was happening. He confirmed that Motala had been assassinated along with his ADC. An officer who was unlucky to have taken the route I normally took to walk was shot near the patrol station on our lower road. The officer turned out to be Colonel Ray Dumuje, who had apparently been mistaken to be me. End of quote. This is the story of how Olusegun Obasanjo, deputy to the slain head of state of Nigeria at the time, escaped being killed by Lieutenant Colonel B. S. Dimka and his men. If Obasanjo had been found by Dimka and his men on the same route with Motala Mohammed, Olusegun Obasanjo would have been obviously killed. What saved him was the delay caused by his visitor, Colonel Olu Bajua who was in Obasanjo's residence early in the morning to inform him of the birth of his son and take permission from Olusegun Obasanjo in line with the custom and tradition of the Yoruba people of Western Nigeria to name the new baby after him. The short period of time spent by Olusegun Obasanjo with Colonel Olu Bajua turned out to be the delay that saved him from meeting death on the road. Obasanjo survived that moment and went on to succeed Motala Mohammed as the new military head of state of Nigeria. He later saw to the conduct of democratic election and handover of power to his civilian president, Alaju Shehu In 1999, Olusegun Obasanjo returned to the number one office in Nigeria, this time as an elected civilian president. He governed Nigeria in the said capacity from 1999 to 2007 when he completed his second term in line with the constitution of Nigeria. Obasanjo is alive and still strong at the time of the making of this video. He remains a significant figure in Nigeria, Africa and the world at large. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to this channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video. I remain your host and friend, Ekemini Udim.